right, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the um, Open for Anti-Racism Participant Showcases. Um, we are super excited uh, to have um, eight of our participants share um, a little bit about their work this spring with their students, and um, thank you all for uh, volunteering to be the first set of folks to, to share with us. Um, there's been some really great work going on, and I've had the opportunity to hear from a few of you up from um, who have done video interviews with us and it just it's the work is just really amazing and all of your insights. So thank you so much. And I'm here with uh, my co-PI, James Clappa Grossclag from College of the Canyons. I'm Una Daly <laughs> from CCCOAR. Forgot to mention that you probably all know by now. Um, and of course, I'm here with Liz Yada, um, our communities manager. And J uh, James, do you want to say anything before we um, jump in? Thank you, Una. Golly, I'm just so excited to, to hear from everybody today and just, just, yeah, thrilled to be here. And we do want to say thank you to the Hewlett Foundation who has been supporting uh, this pilot program this year and um, is continues to be very interested in how it's going. Uh, and I know that Angela DeBarge has been joining us for some of these webinars. I'm not sure if she was able to make it today. All right. I think you all know that the Community College Consortium for OER has been working with colleges around the nation uh, since 2007. And um, it, it really, it's all about um, creating equitable uh, opportunities for students uh, in their higher ed careers. And of course, faculty are, are the keys to that. And so we're, and we're really thrilled to work with uh, the California Community College faculty on this program. And for those of you who are joining us today from, who are not uh, participants in the program, I think you probably know this program. It's, it's essentially a one-year program, although it was a little shortened this year. It started in December um, and finishes up next month. Um, and it was an opportunity for faculty to explore, to explore how they can use OER and open pedagogy to make their instructional materials and their teaching practices more anti-racist. And so they've been involved in um, this experiment uh, over the last six months, um, taking a course uh, around awareness, uh, familiarity with all of these concepts, and then planning an action plan or putting together an action plan for the spring semester. And as you can see, uh, we have faculty from um, all over the discipline, uh, <laughs> Uh, a rainbow, if you will. And you are gonna hear from eight of them today who've been doing this work uh, with their students. And James, I'm sure you, you might wanna jump in and say something. <laughs> well, I just wanna say how inspiring it is to uh, know that in the California Community Colleges, we have uh, hundreds and hundreds of faculty who are interested in doing this work. Uh, we were able to work with 17 colleagues this year but we had over 330 applications from around, uh, across our state. So that's really great to know uh, that there are so many people who want to do this work. And uh, we've got great inspirations here today. And we know that they are also carrying what they've learned back to their institutions. Absolutely. And um, uh, James and I and um, Joy and Kim have been sharing a little bit at some of the regional conferences about this program. Um, and there's been a lot of excitement. Um, we, we were most recently at the Peralta Equity Conference that was in, um, I think was in early May or late April, starting to lose track now of all those conferences. And we'll also be talking next week at the Northeast OER Summit. Um, so um, there's interest, I think, um, both, of course, within California, but also nationally. All right, at this point, um, I am ready to uh, turn it over to our first presenter, uh, who is Jill Bradshaw. Uh, at Fals She's faculty at Folsom Lake uh, College up in the Sacramento area, and uh, she's a uh, faculty member in, uh, in social work and human services. And I'm going to stop sharing, Jill, so that you can do that. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm turning my camera off real quick um, because my internet connection is not great. So if I do too much at one time, it, it does not like me. So I'm hoping that then I can share my screen. Are you able to see this? We are. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, my project took place in my Introduction to Social Work Human Services class. 
and just a little teeny bit of background about this class. This is a survey class um, to introduce students to the profession of social work. And one of the ways we do that is we talk with students about um, these professional grand challenges for our discipline that we hope all students will be interested in working on. So um, this grand challenges approach was developed back in 2013 and originally there were just 12 challenges, but last summer they decided to modify um this to create 13 challenges to specifically address racism so before that racism was always kind of um, interwoven into all the other social issues that we were trying to address um, but now our profession decided to call out like um, many of us in our society as a whole and just look at racism on its own so that was really what i had in mind um, coming into this project in the fall was how I could incorporate that better into my curriculum. Um, the group um, from the social work profession working on these grand challenges had some very specific strategies that they were hoping that faculty could implement. And one of them um, that um, felt like a really good fit, especially for this grant, is to talk about structural inequalities and white privilege and racism in our social work classes. So this was a great project for me. So what I wanted to do was I already had a brief module um, on cultural competence. And I had been working um, for the past year or so to kind of expand that into this um, idea of looking at cultural humility, which is just kind of a, um, a way to expand cultural competence so that um, it's better understood as not like a take a one-time seminar and you're an expert in this kind of thing, um, but that it's critical self-reflection, that it's ongoing and that type of thing. So I want to expand that module and then add in race, racism, and this new language of anti-racism that was very new for most of my students. So what I did is I started this project by doing um, a lecture for students and explaining to them what the grant was and what the module I wanted to create. And then I asked them for their input. I asked them a bunch of questions actually about their understanding of certain language and terms so I could be sure what to include. Um, but also um, their willingness kind of to discuss this subject. And most students were on board, I should say. I've included a quote from a student who was not so on board. Um, but most students seem pretty interested in the project. So then working from their feedback, um, I put together a module um, that included some things that students said they wanted to know more about. So students um, had questions about what the difference is between race and ethnicity. And so I gave them you know, a short video on that. Um, students were very interested in learning about white privilege, those who were new to the concept or maybe not so excited to learn about it, but felt like they needed to know. So um, I included this video, which was actually very well received by students who had not seen it before. So I'm glad I included that. Um, I included a lecture on, this is an, an hour long lecture um, by Dr. Powell about structural racism, which is really good. I asked my students to only watch 30 minutes of it, but many of them watched the whole thing, which I was very excited about. And then of course I um, had some videos introducing Professor Kendi and his work on anti-racism. And also some um, information for students about intersectionality. That was a term that a lot of students had heard but didn't really understood how it fit into this conversation. And then other things students said in the survey is they wanted to know what they could do now and um, what they could do, you know, planning to be a professional social worker moving forward. So we included some of that in the um, ideas in the module, including um, how to talk openly about racism. Um, I included this video, um, which has Brene Brown. If you're familiar with her, she's a social worker. So um, I really like to share her work a lot with my students because she's very well known, um, but she likes to have difficult conversations. So he, um, this video, again, I asked students just to watch eight minutes of it of an hour long discussion about racism and a lot of students watched the whole thing, which was cool. And then finally, I asked students for recommendations. So I included this in um, ideas for readings and videos to share with other students um, and included that in the module as well. And so overall, um, the feedback from students was very positive. I just um, launched the module at the last week of the semester and I asked them to provide feedback. So I'm working through that feedback now and I'll make changes um, to the module. Um, so far, I've shared information within my own department. We have a professional learning community. So I told them about the grant and what I was working on and got their input and ideas as well. 
And then once I go through the student feedback and make a final version of the module, I'll share it with my department, of course, and the other social work or related departments at my sister colleges, because there's four of us in our district. Um, and then uh, finally, I plan to share the module through Canvas Commons as well. And then I know one of the things we were asked to discuss is lessons learned or ideas for going forward. So this was the big thing for me was the timing. Um, it was just so much to do in one semester. So I thought ideally, <laughs> um, if I would, could uh, tell grant writers how to put this together in the future is to have a full year for faculty to spread that out. All right, thanks so much. Wonderful, thank, thank you. Uh... Jill, that was really uh, exciting to hear about the work you did with your students. And also, thank you for the recommendation. We really appreciate that. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I probably should have mentioned this up front, but we're going to hold the Q&A to the end. But please do put your questions in the chat window um, it, so that we don't lose track of them and because uh, we, we do want to be able to answer those. And we'll, we have some extra time at the end. All right. Next up, um, and I'm not going to switch to my slides just to save a little bit of time. Our next up is Hasna Sadat Ahadi uh, from Palomar Community College, and she is going to talk about her Counseling 110 College Success course. Thanks, Thank Hasna. you so much, Una. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Hasna Sadat Ahadi, and I'm an assistant professor in counseling at Palomar College in North County of San Diego. My pronouns are she, her, ella. Before I begin my presentation today, I would like to make a land acknowledgement and recognize that I in North County, San Diego is blessed to be on the land of the Lucinio, Kumayai, Cupeño, and the Cuyala people. I encourage you all to learn about the land you are on and continue to make land acknowledgements with statements and actions to support the indigenous and native communities in the past, present, and future. The course I taught this semester is Counseling 110, uh, College Success, which is a multicultural course that provides students with skills and knowledge of multiculturalism to meet their educational and personal goals. As an educator, it's imperative that I share my positionality with my students so they understand my phenomenology and perspective. This semester, I have placed my positionality statement in the introduction segment of my syllabus, but also welcome a recording I provided on Canvas for my students. My salient positionality includes being a proud community college graduate, an immigrant, transnational, multi-ethnic, multicultural, womanist, abolitionist, anti-racist, decolonizer, activist, counselor, and educator. I really wanted to transform my entire course and endeavor to get as much of the goals I listed on my action plan. I started off with decolonizing my course syllabus and used my own research to taking these necessary steps. To me, decolonization is about dismantling colonial ideologies, racial hierarchy, and hegemony in my course. This includes eradicating punitive language, being flexible when students submitting their assignments, and creating a validating and welcoming environment for students. I noticed when my course turned into a zero textbook cost this semester, my enrollment went up. This allowed me to really reflect on the vast amount of students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged and the importance of alleviating financial barriers for them. I ensured all my materials were ADA compliant and accommodations were met for students on all abilities. I had, the, I had students review my college's pronoun guide and input their own pronoun on Canvas as well as Zoom. This semester, I was intentional with including multiracial authors and presenters when it comes to articles and TED Talks and so forth. I had my students complete three surveys in my course and the RP group survey as well. Conducting surveys allowed me to gather both qualitative and quantitative responses from my students to see what worked for them and what didn't work for them in the modules, their contribution to the curriculum, and learning about their lived experiences. During the first week, students co-created community agreements, and each week they used these agreements when providing feedback on discussion posts and group work. By having students complete an informational survey the first week of school, it allowed me to learn more about their cultural identity and practices throughout my teaching curriculum so I can embed it. Due to the limitations, I will share some activities my students engaged in this semester. I asked my students this question to respond to in their journal. How old were you when you first learned about racism and how? 
Student number one said, I learned about racism in school when we discussed topics such as blackface and I would read historical novels about Pearl Harbor and the Asian hate that took place back then. I also experienced racism personally for being a woman of color as well as being a mixed race woman of color. Student number two said, I was very young, maybe five when my mom told me about racism and discrimination towards Arabs and Muslims. There are a plethora of counter stories my students shared and some experienced racism while others perpetuated it. Before eradicating racism, we need to understand what it is and how to confront it. I had students learn about imposter syndrome and they watched a TED talk by Dina Simmons. I highly recommend it if you haven't watched it yet. Students then provided their experiences with imposter syndrome on the survey and provided suggestions on how to overcome it. When I learned, what I learned in the surveys is that four students who indicated they never experienced imposter syndrome were also all white males. While, while the rest of the student population identified it as, as communities of color, LGBTQIA plus and women. We need to stop telling students to get over their imposter syndrome and instead recognize how colonialism has attempted to disempower communities to feel less than and dismantle the practice entirely beginning with preschool settings. Students read and annotated the article titled Racial Microaggressions in Everyday Life, Implications for Clinical Practice by Daryl Wing Su and colleagues 2007. Students then journaled and completed a survey regarding ever experiencing racial microaggressions and the nine students who said no, all but one identified as white. There were many who also disclosed that they perpetuated racial microaggressions and didn't realize how bad it was until now. Teaching critical consciousness is important for students to acknowledge racism and the impact of it rather than just me telling them it's wrong. Although there are one or two students who have white supremacy thinking, as the semester is progressing, so is their critical consciousness to being accepted and open-minded, the true work of social justice. Majority of my students have remarked positively to this course uh, and indicated feeling liberated, empowered, validated, and have great sense of belonging. This upcoming fall 2021 plenary at Palomar College, I will be sharing my experience with Open for Anti-Racism and how liberating my students feel with my curriculum, pedagogy, and practice being transformed. The next steps I would like, I'm sorry. Okay, the next steps I would like to incorporate in my teaching includes universal design for learning, grading for equity, creating an equity-minded rubric, global perspective counseling, and changing the course outline for record for all counseling courses. I learned that liberation and education to be achieved, there should be no oppressive system or practice in place. I learned about the importance of critical consciousness for those who are oppressed to recognize their oppression and seek to overcome it through liberation. We must remember education is activism and only we have the choice to liberating and eradicating the marginality of people in your classroom and in our communities. In the words of Bettina Love, education can't save us, we have to save education. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me as I have to now leave for another presentation elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hasna. That, that was wonderful. <laughs> and uh, I loved your list of um, things you're gonna do next fall. Um, and in fact, um, I think some of those topics are gonna be discussed at the upcoming California OER um, uh, conference in August. So great place. And it, there's still time to submit to that. Um, as well, and I hope uh, many of you will th consider that. Um, all right, uh, we are going to move on to our next uh, speaker. So thank you very much, Hasna and Anna Garcia Garcia from Monterey Peninsula College. She is a chemistry professor there, and she's going to talk about Chem Two and Geology Nine. Very good. Let me um, make sure I have the right screen. I'm hoping everybody can see uh, this very red screen. I just created for you. It looks perfect. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, hola a todos. My name is Anna. I am uh, lucky enough that I teach at MPC uh, both chemistry and earth sciences classes. So I was trying to find something that I could use with both of my classes this semester. Uh, before I go uh, moving on, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I'm so thankful for the opportunity. And I wanted to thank the crew, everybody here from the uh, visionaries to the uh, to the cohort because they have helped uh, think about uh, new ideas and just uh, you know 
uh, making this much, much better. And if you haven't yet, please discover your library. The librarians were very, very, uh, very helpful on, on the journey. So what I decided to do was find something easy, as I am a beginner, easy to do two things, engage my students in my science classes and also empower them uh, through open pedagogy. So what I'm gonna show you today is basically just uh, a little task that I asked them to do to create um, a slide with open resources uh, and they had to think about scientists. They had to think about how do they identify with one scientist. And the idea was to show them how varied and diverse science can be and uh, try to avoid showcasing just male old uh, role models, uh, male people that we always see on those, on those um, books. So I just wanted to show you a couple of examples of what have, uh, my students have done. They're still working on it. The deadline is next week. Uh, this is just an example of Ms. Juju. Uh, she got picked because she actually helped extract one of the um, um, artemisinin, which is part of a malaria um, fighting. Uh, I put in, in bold letters here the why. That was the most important part for me. What was the reflection on the student? In this case, this student is actually a veteran and wanted to show her, showcase her because she's a disadvantaged woman uh, and made a lot of sacrifices like he did. Um, another example for you, uh, Dr. Brady, he's actually kind of famous in the chemistry world. He was the first African-American to earn a doctorate and the student picked him because not only his accomplishments were exceptional today, it's just in the, the time that he actually lived were extra extraordinary. Um, I have a third one for you. Um, some student also picked Marie Curie. This is not, a, not surprising. I was hoping somebody would. Uh, what I liked about this slide is that the student actually drew her um, and also that she shared the story that in her household only her male siblings would get the science kits and how difficult it was for her to actually get um, in touch with the science part uh, of learning and so that actually struck a chord with me. Um, so that's what they are doing is going to be an open uh, a chunk of uh, uh, open uh, sourced uh, slides that I can share out with all the students in the fall and as a guide. So talking about res uh, how receptive they were before I actually add this activity, I asked my students how included they felt in classes. And you'll see two numbers here. One is for my non-majors. This is the social science students, mostly it's a geology class that they take because they need the credits. Uh, the second one there at the bottom is the, the chemistry students. There are the majors. And uh, you know, ideally I would want to have them both in a five, but as you can see at least before I did anything in these classrooms, the students felt pretty included in general. Now, when I asked them about how would you think about adding anti-racist material, the uh, answers surprised me a lot. I'd like to hear definitely what you have to say. As you can see the, the students that were mostly non-majors, they had a almost 70, let's call it 70% positive response. And that means Either they were very excited about me adding any type of material or they didn't mind. Uh, that's what positive was for me. But when you look at the science majors, you can see how the positive rate goes down to almost 44. This is still not zero, but uh, this was very surprising to me because my classes are full of very diverse students and very young students. So anyway, that's something to think about. Um, a couple more things for you today. Uh, I, as everybody here probably, I, I'd like to share, I actually have shared this with my chemistry and earth sciences departments already. And I'm looking forward uh, to flex days and in particular to this new task force that we have in campus that is called IDEA, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity and Anti-Racism. So hopefully I'll, I'll be very active with them uh, in the near future. I learned a lot. This comes from a beginner's point of view. But you definitely need time to reflect in order for this to really make sense and do what we want it to do. Uh, I have a note there saying that it can be tricky to implement depending on your students. Uh, that was very surprising, the type of students um, that we could have. Um, our library definitely was really useful for me because I had to teach all my students about open resources. So that is a really way, it's a really good way to, to help you um, secure the, uh, that part of the uh, activity. And then uh, what I did this year was 
adding this as an extra point, what I am working on and I will be doing in the summer is infuse tasks like this and others as part of the curriculum in the fall, as opposed to just like an add on. Um, that makes more sense to me. Thank you for listening. That's all I have. Wonderful. Th thank you so much, um, Anna, and um, very interesting um, research uh, with your students about um, the, sci the science majors versus the non-science majors. It'd be interesting to hear about um, how other folks have uh, heard from their students as well. Wonderful. All right. Next up is Oliver Rosales, who is a faculty member in history at Bakersfield uh, College. So I can go ahead and share my screen. Is that right? Yes, please. Okay. Can everyone see that okay? Uh, yeah. Okay, so my name is Oliver Rosales. I'm a professor of history at Bakersfield College. And one resource that I introduced to address anti-racism in my California history course, as well as my Latinx history course, uh, was the creation of an interactive GIS map. Um, this was in, administered through Survey 123. And the project uh, embraces anti-racism in particular with the exclusion of people of color and migrant groups from historical archives. Um, I truly believe that archives reflect power, you know, who can and cannot shape historical narratives. And this, of course, impacts, you know, the stories that we tell in the classroom. So students need to see themselves in history and their exclusion from archives is a reflection of, again, racism embedded in both the historical profession and preservation efforts more broadly. Um, therefore, I designed this assignment that enables students to recover family histories uh, through an oral history project, an essay, and a multimedia project. And the project yeah, in my view, uh, really realigns the power structure, right, uh, with the learning environment to engage students as, as active learners in exploring California history. And in a, in a place based context in the San Joaquin Valley, it, it serves a very specific uh, purpose to create new regional archives that are basically unexamined by scholars or other large scale public history projects. And I'll circle back and talk about the map in a moment. But as a point of background, I also wanna share um, that Bakersfield College hosted this spring, uh, the Smithsonian traveling uh, exhibit entitled Dolores World Re Revolution in the Fields. And as an organizer behind this exhibit, I was involved in the, the conversion of the physical exhibit into the virtual tour. And we had to get you know, grant fundings to do this and it's accessible by the public. So it's a great, great resource. And my motivation for bringing the exhibit was to showcase to students the rich legacy of agriculture, migration, labor and civil rights history within the San Joaquin Valley through the lens of Dolores Huerta. And I, I did this in part through this exhibit down here, there's a little section called testimonials where I had uh, some students uh, share their experiences with agriculture, with, with labor. All, the, all these students have close ties to, to either working in the fields or their parents working in the fields, and they, they, they resonate with the story. But I wanted to expand this like on a much larger level to the, the classroom besides just doing these little videos, and that's where um, the ArcGIS and Survey123 uh, came into play. So um, for example, this is um, survey one, two, three. It's an extension of ArcGIS technology. And I was able to administer this survey to my students. Actually, all my classes did this. I had uh, each class uh, complete a survey about where they were from within the county, their family origins, and then they could go to a GIS map and say where they were from, like where does their family trace their origins? And I did a little video of myself doing this and my family comes like from Chihuahua. So I was able to do that. And the really cool, exciting thing that I was just so jazzed about with this was um, students were able to um, upload historical family artifacts, like whatever's in your home, like whatever means something to you. Like I would always tell my students that there was this little watch that my grandfather had from his time as a worker for the Southern Pacific Railroad. And so students were able to go into their home and find that special object and load it into to this, this mapping system. And all of this becomes like aggregate data that you can basically use um, for the public, right? So I think students generally have been receptive to this, this integration of the technology. Uh, ArcGIS is a very powerful visual tool that can um, map a community story in really, really uh, innovative ways. Um, I'm still tinkering th with this. I think this took me a long time to get to the point where I was able to kind of, you know, design a survey and see what happens with the data. Um, most of the way that I've been um, sh showcase showcasing this with students and to the public is through this particular website. And this is this involves the, um, the open source here. 
So as students were doing their projects and submitting things, um, I would start to curate their submissions. So for example, I'm clicking under these story sections. This is a Google site that I have created for my course. And so all of these little links here represent things that students have submitted. Some, sometimes they're photographs, other times you have students who um, put together the Creative uh, Commons license videos, like oral histories, uh, narratives, like they're really creative. And I, I've just been so pleased with the project. And I wanted to note that, um, you know, th there's, there's a kind of tension between like, surveying all of the students and gathering data. So like this, this interactive map, you can click on a link and it takes you to an individual student who submitted something, right, and completed the survey. And uh, most students, by the time they uh, got through the course, I think I administered this survey in week 15, uh, they were comfortable doing this, right? That massive data submission versus, um, you know, qualitative students or students who did exemplary work that I could then encourage to go through the Creative Commons licensing process to share with the public, they were much more willing to do that than say a student who, you know, might have uh, not put as much effort into the assignment. So I like being able to survey um, the large scale student data to tell the community narrative, but then also to, to really zone in and dig deeply with the students who do exemplary work. One other thing I wanted to share really quickly too, that I haven't done yet, um, but this is something I'm planning to do over the next few semesters, um, is story mapping. So story mapping is an extension of the ArcGIS uh, technology that I was showing. So once you uh, do a, a mass data survey to your students on a particular issue or topic, um, then that data can then be uh, configured into the story map, which is like a website, but it's just, it's, it's very dynamic and, and you know, you can engagingly tell a story in, in new ways. It's, it's a little more, you know, uh, I would say innovative than a Google site, for example. So I'm still tinkering with this, but this is a more of a long-term project as I start to collect data over the semesters. And one of the things I'll just say too, like, you know, for me, I teach at Bakersfield College, look where my students come from. <laughs> they, they come from Mexico. Uh, but you also really get some interesting stories of like black migration from Texas, you know, the, the Appalachians, you got Central American students. And so it's, it's, it's also about finding common ground uh, with migration, but also to recognize, you know, the importance of a Hispanic serving institution and that, you know, the curriculum needs to reflect that. So um, I wanna to try to keep myself on, on pace here. How will I share this with my campus? I, I do plan to share um, my experience with ArcGIS and Survey123 with my, my, my campus via our Flex workshops. Um, I think my campus is in desperate need right now of, you know, conversations surrounding uh, anti-racist pedagogy. And, you know, I can share enthusiastically my example of, of doing this with family histories and, you know, creating non-disposable assignments that can change community narratives. So I'm just so absolutely so jazzed about that. Um, my institution one also- One minute left. I'll, I'll wrap it up in 60 seconds. Uh, my institution also doesn't have an ArcGIS um, subscription. So I'm hoping that this will encourage them to actually purchase that. Um, and my other plan is to develop the, um, the Canvas uh, Commons module that I can share in companion uh, with the Dolores Huerta exhibit. So high school teachers can do this and also participate in the survey and data collection. So I'm very excited about that. Um, thank you so much, Ofar. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you, Oliver. That is, is so inspiring. And um, I, I know that your students must just really appreciate, uh, you know, seeing themselves in the, the history and the, you know, the important contributions that they and their families have made. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, um, we have uh, Nakia Cheney from Cabrillo College, and she's an English uh, professor there. And Nikki, I didn't see your name in the participants window, so I'm not sure if you are here today. Oh, wonderful. You you yeah. were under Joy Shoemate. Okay, so yeah. great to see you, Nikki. Thank you. Yeah. So hello, my name is Nikki Cheney, um, and I'm an English instructor at Cabrillo College. Um, and I've been teaching English too, um, critical thinking, and I've been wanting to teach this in a certain in a way that is more inclusive to students, especially when it comes to my own lived experiences and some things that I've been um, interested in. 
So I'm going to take us through just a sort of example of some different things that I've been doing. Uh, I am still in the process of working, so they all feel a little bit everywhere. They haven't kind of coalesced into any kind of, you know, this is the one thing that I've worked on. But when I started this program, I had already created a Canvas module for Black Lives Matter. Um, and part of what I wanted to do is make sure that I had revised that module, I licensed that module, and I shared that module. And that is something that I did complete. I got really interested in open education resources and contributing to open education resources, especially um, something like this Black Lives Matter module, because I could not find information um, when I wanted to teach this to my students. I had looked for OER information on Black Lives Matter and it was very sparse and very few. So I had to do a lot of um, primary source documentation and, and, and looking for things like that. So I did do that. I was able to share something with the OER. And then finally, um, I, I like Oliver Rosales, uh, interesting. I was very, very interested in this idea of non-disposable assignments versus disposable assignments. And so I wanted to give my students a way of sharing their voices authentically um, and the literature that they read and the things that they researched um, in a way that wasn't something they would just throw away. I wanted them to, I wanted them to see themselves, see that showcased um, and connect with each other through that. So I'm going to share uh, these projects with you. Let me reshare the screen. Um, let's see, and you guys should be able to see this. So this is the Black Lives Matter um, module. And this has been shared with um, my department. I revised it, it had been downloaded about 25 times, but I went through and I kind of did an entire, entire uh, revision of it. Um, and one of the things that I'm really proud that I've worked on is the assignments for students, the curation and documenting um, Black Lives Matter. So if you go through the module, um, you'll see that we have like our overview uh, with our key events, our timelines, we have important terms, um, there's art, poetry, essays, some documentaries in there. And then this one, again, the assignments for the students. One of the things that I thought that, oh, one of the things that I thought that was really, really important about this, and I may have to go into a class, is, well, well you know what? I've shared this also with um, Creative Commons. So let me stop sharing. <laughs> and see if I can, there we go. Okay, and let me share again. Ah, sorry, you guys. Best laid plans, right? Best no laid worries. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> ah, we had to do this so quickly um, that there's just, you know, there just is what it is. So, okay, so for Creative Commons. So this is on Creative Commons, and this is pretty much the same thing that's in Canvas. It's been modified a little bit differently. It's got some of the same things in here, but I wanted you to see the assignments that I made for the students uh, when we come down to the, um, the assignments that's asking them to curate Black Lives Matter pictures that they're finding or they're taking um, and that they're participating in and write about them a little bit. And I thought that was really, really wonderful. The students love this and it was 100% participation um, in both classes that I taught for doing this. Uh, and so I was really, really happy that they were able to kind of um, connect with this and, and use this and then being able to see their work um, online. That is something that I haven't been able to do yet. I'm still working on creating a website, creating something so that we have a large repository for some of these things. I haven't been able to finish that. Um, we definitely need more time. But I really, I really do like that this is up and ready and, and out there and ready to be shared. Looking back at um, non-disposable versus disposable assignments, uh, a second sort of thing that I created with another instructor is that we began to do podcasts. And we talked about some of the things that we learned, um, that I learned in this in OFAR, and we ended up dedicating this to Black voices and social justice. Um, we really wanted to make sure that these podcasts were reflecting things for unheard students and unheard voices. And if you scroll down some of our um, some of our, our episodes and our sessions, you'll find that um, students are talking about literature. They're talking about some of the galleries. We had a gallery exhibit at Cabrillo um, and they're doing research on these. 
And I began to see that having the students do this as an assignment, this is something I'm working towards, um, just makes them more interested in doing it and wanting to do it. So I was, I was really uh, happy that students could, um, they could really learn the, the different pedagogy of a non-disposable assignment um, and, and how that, that stays. And so they've been very, very, very excited about this. I did survey my students for the Black Lives Matter module and you know, about 27 that responded, which is pretty good for a college class. And you'll see that overwhelmingly, um, the majority of them felt that it was helpful to them. None felt that it was, it was non-helpful. This is a college campus that has 1% African-American student population um, and about 60% uh, Hispanic serving student um, and Hispanic students. So it was very interesting to me that they all connected with this lesson, even though it was something that um, they might not have thought of explicitly. So I thought that was an, uh, a really wonderful um, takeaway from this as well. And what I learned, and let me go back to my, my PowerPoint, what I learned from OFAR was that anti-racist teaching involves changing the practices that we have in our classes and thinking of teaching in a different way. I'm really loving how the online environment can create these spaces for equity and these spaces for change that we can make repositories for our students so that they can see and reflect their own voices. Um, we can give them agency. Um, we can tell them that they matter, but we can also show them that explicitly through them being able to see themselves online. Um, and then finally, I'm really appreciative of the fact that um, I'm in a position that as an educator, that we can make this type of change. And so I just want to thank everybody for this opportunity. Um, again, you know, I'm, I need more time. <laughs> I'm one of the ones that say I definitely need, I wish I had an entire year to work on this. And I want to kind of coalesce it into a one uh, overall project. I feel like I'm doing a lot of different things, um, but I feel like I've learned so much and my students have been very appreciative. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Nikia. This is amazing. And um, I, I we'll ask you to share your slides afterwards. So we'll, we'll incorporate them in and maybe you can put a link or two in there because I know people are, are gonna wanna go to OER Commons and Canvas Commons and find those. Um, those modules. So lovely. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right. Now, um, oops, I, uh, sorry. I, I think next up is um, Tara Bunig, and I'm, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Tara is a chemistry professor at um, Modesto, um, Modesto Junior College. I, I think I've got that right. Yes. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's Tara Bunig. Thank so you. I know it's a, uh, thank you for, for asking. Um, all right, so, uh, so this, my project is on uh, Chemistry 143 as a uh, introductory chemistry course. So this course is specifically geared towards students who are pre-nursing, typically pre-health. So there's very, um, it's a little bit different of a population than we get for like the general chemistry course. Uh, it's a one semester course, so it's a pretty intense uh, course that they do. Uh, and I, I've done a few different things around the OFAR project. Uh, I had you know, some of the challenges with the timeline because uh, the, um, the course that we were doing for OFAR actually uh, overlapped with the start of my semester. So I was already two weeks into my course before we were implementing our plans. So uh, a lot of my plan is a uh, really involving things that are going to be happening this summer, but uh, I did do some things during the semester. So there's some basic elements that I've gotten to the course. Some of these were already existing in the course that you know I uh, pulled from previous semesters. So things like having open educational resources for everything. So I've got, um, and I'll show some examples of what, what I had there for in the next slide. Um, I also uh, made an adjustment to make sure that everything was available, you know, in you know Canvas online or print for everything. So everything is, you know, so students can view all of this stuff online, or there's ways of getting the, all of those things in print for the things that are required for them to actually either print out or to do on paper. Uh, they also were able to get, you know, free packets so they can 
to get that. So things about that, uh, a real focus on flexibility. So uh, as far as the design of the course, so due date flexibility, I kind of went with a practice, somebody had suggested using um, more of a uh, best by date. So having, um, instead of, you know, saying absolutely sharp dead due dates, you say that it's best if you can get it done by this date, but if you can't, then, you know, there's flexibility there. Uh, flexibility around how to read or watch the material. So every objective in the course, there's uh, a video about, there's a reading about, and there's, um, and we also had a, a actual lecture time about. So the students could kind of choose which way they did it. And uh, some choices around how they actually participate in the course. So they could come to the you know, synchronous lecture time or they could do inks asynchronously. They could, you know, uh, participate, you know, in discussions either verbally or, you know, so doing videos or written or, you know, so just a lot of uh, flexibility around the course. So those were things I was able to incorporate in kind of last minute. Uh, the actual specific activity that I introduced during the semester for OPAR was around a question building activity. One thing is that, um, one challenge with chemistry is that students often see these questions as being really out there. They're not connected to their reality. They're not connected to their lives. And um, so I had them you know, essentially build questions that would then be, and kind of as an incentive for them, uh, uh, I you know, had them actually, uh, uh, in Canvas, you can actually have students uh, like, a, like their posts. So I had them write questions and then these questions that got the most likes were then put onto their final exam. Uh, and uh, it, it works within this course because uh, students for this type of chemistry course are very, 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 very great focused. <laughs> Getting them to focus on anything else is, is very uh, challenging. Uh, so I wanted them to actually take something that was gonna actually affect their grade, but also um, allow them to bring in their own personality and their own experiences. So I, I got some, some of the, a lot of the, the work was, you know, kind of the, were fairly generic questions, but uh, some of the st students really got into it, like writing questions about temperature conversions from going to other countries, uh, calculate, I, I love these examples. So I had one student who you know, was, uh, had us calculate the grams of certain nutrients in their child's favorite fruit and, you know, including their child's name and things. Uh, world, word problems that uh, other than being like a pretty standard word problem, they incorporated their friends or family members' names. So that was kind of nice because then, um, I mean, if I generate questions, then I, you know, use names that are familiar to me and yeah, I try and use, you know, a variety of names, but students know the people that they know and it helps to, I think, um, get some names and, situations that are a little bit more uh, authentic. And they did actually use, you know, quite a number of these questions on their final exam. Uh, they <laughs> really seem to appreciate that. Uh, so the next steps on this uh, are gonna be a lot more intense. So that the, um, so there's a lot of issues with the textbook. I did do some analysis within the OPRA program on things like pictures and examples. And pictures and examples in this book, um, I mean, there's a lot of different topics that are covered, but there's virtually no diversity. Um, every scientist who is shown in the book is male and appears to be white. Uh, every, uh, every person who is not male or not white is either not a scientist or doing something completely different. Uh, even the examples of like somebody um, holding a test tube are a very white hand. <laughs> it's, you know, just, and it's, you know, it's pervasive. Uh, I knew one, this was- One minute be, left. Yeah. Uh, so I'll be doing some of the revisions on that and also identifying some open pedagogy projects. Um, I want to kind of pull from another course I'm doing, uh, Chem 150, which uh, has students doing a, um, case studies in science. So they pull from that and they actually create the materials for the course. So I kind of will to build that out. It takes a long time to do it. So I want to do that for, for fall, or spring, having students do a lot more of creation of materials. 
and uh, we're sharing that out. Anna and I are working on the uh, Anna and I are working on the CCID project, so we're doing some things on uh, incorporating uh, uh, this within a larger context and really getting it out there. Also, sharing within my camp campus and the textbook materials that I showed on my slides. Those are all in LibreText, Libre and those are currently available. So once I you know, if we share these slides, I'll. I, I've actually shared those links a lot with the OFAR group, but you know, I'd be very happy to, to share the links to the actual textbook materials. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Tara. And Tara, the textbook that you're using right now that you were just talking about, would, that is from LibreText? Yes. So I modified a LibreText, uh, an existing LibreText to uh, use for my course. Um, it um, it was uh, I, there was no specific labor text existing for this course. It, I mean, some people had kind of generated parts of their own, and so I had to uh, retool that a lot. So it's it does need a lot of work, <laughs> but it's it's a really good start because you know at least it is free versus some of the the uh, not so free course you know materials that were used in the past that are just awful. So wonderful and, and, yep. and, and opportunity to ha have your students also contribute uh, maybe to finding those images, um, you know, as, as time and circumstances mm -hmm. allow. Yeah, right. And, and the students in this class are very collaborative. They really love to to share their materials. And, you know, whenever I have that type of an opportunity for them to share the, the things that they're using for studying, it comes. They're very good about that. I mean, they're they're future nurses. They like to help each other and they like to help people. And so that's, you know, I think they put, they, they found it pretty appealing, the idea of being able to help each other through this and kind of share um, projects and, and different things. That's great. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much. And our next speaker is Deborah Crumpton from a Sacramento City College. Um, and she is a professor of business and um, Hey everybody, good afternoon. So I'm gonna turn my camera off because uh, like Jill, I'm just praying that my internet holes in this rural area. So let me turn my camera off, share my screen. <clears throat> and uh, does everybody see that screen? Um, I'm not seeing it yet. Uh-oh. Uh, hmm. Not seeing it yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Perhaps uh, here. There we go. Yep. Now we can see it. <laughs> All right. All right. So you see it now? We do. All right. Wonderful. So again, I'm Deborah Crumpton, and I teach at uh, Sacramento City College. And I just uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity. So thank you. I won't spend a lot of time going through the land acknowledgement, but I like to remind myself and others that you know we all stand on on stolen land, really. And so um, as I looked at business, and I teach uh, several business courses, but introduction to business tends to be our bread and butter course and where we get so many incoming students, so many first time students and so many freshmen. So it was the ideal course to start with looking at um, anti-racism. Um, I, I have always struggled with this course, quite honestly, because I, I know right that it is, it is for offered as a, like a for whites only discipline. And so my intention was to, and still is, is to um, integrate OER texts into remixing OER texts to make sure all my course content is anti-racist and to create learning experiences for students that are not only personalized to them, but allow them to see themselves and to encourage student generated um, uh, content and for them to be able um, to curate their own stuff. Well, I, um, I started with this mindset, right? And that it is a colonized discipline and often, um, like in most texts, where right? students do not see themselves. And if they do see themselves, it's, it's always in this position of the exception, right? The Oprah Winfrey, the JC exception, and, and a narrow myopic focus of entertainers and people who are not, you know, real business people for say. And so this misrepresentation, this myopic view is something that I have um, been wanting to, um, wanting to break, I guess is the best word that I would use. So, you know, for me, this whole journey, um, starts with the radicalization, the racialization of me, because I have um, I've had to step outside of myself and take a really hard look at who I am and and where my thinking is, where my beliefs have come from, and having spent um, 
from the time I was 19 to uh, almost 40 years old in the military, I had a lot of work to do on myself. And so I had to decolonize myself, quite frankly, and still am in that process. Before I um, was privileged to be in this particular program, I had also I had done a lot of work on anti-racism with my courses. So decolonizing my text is something I'd already had done. I had been looking at OER text, but I will tell you I had a very skewed um, view of OER, but now <laughs> OER is, is all I speak about. So I have an OER text for my introduction business class. It's a Libra text, it requires a lot of work, but at least it's free and students are getting started. So one of the things that I really wanted to focus on, although I had this really grand scheme going into this with my action plan, was assignments. And there were two particular assignments in my, um, in my class that I think um, gave students the biggest um, focus on, on race. I realized in retrospect that I really needed to racialize the entire course, but I started with these two assignments in particular. And the significant racially minoritized assignment was students had to find an entrepreneur like them. That was a real fun assignment for students. The more challenging assignment was this analysis of racial bias and marketing. So I started students with a really easy, um, feel good kind of video. This is a two minute video that's available on YouTube. And it talks a little bit about uh, racial, racialism, racism and marketing and you know, kind of what the beauty and retail industry is doing. But the more challenging video was this young man who started talking about, he was in stores and started talking about his, his real, um, uh, he was looking at different products and his real take on different products. And he, you know, he started showing products like Anne Jemima and talking about it and using really uh, what I would call very plain language about whose mama is this, right? Not my mama. And so I knew students could get engaged with that but I also knew that students would be triggered by it, which was good. So I started this particular uh, module for my students by doing two things. One is I gave them, I, I offered a video to them. And in my video, I said, you know, racism is something that is most uncomfortable for people to talk about, but is necessary. And I talked to them, to them about being in a racialized um, environment. And unlike this video I'm doing with you right now, it was just me, right? It was just me talking to them. And, and so I also gave, talked about how I wanted them to talk about race, right? How I wanted them to, to approach this particular assignment. And I reminded them, as you see in, in, this, um, in this narrative I had here, that they can only talk about their experience, right? That they're not to generalize. They can't speak for anyone else. They need to recognize that everyone has their own sense of truth. And so I wanted them to really um, peel back the onion, so to speak, on this particular video and to really start to interrogate uh, racism from their own life lens. Well, so now I start to ask students for, you know, how did you come to this? So how was it for you? And so for my students of color, um, they, they clearly saw themselves in this. Um, it was really interesting um, to, to, for some of my white students. And I, you know, I'm picking out some phrases that really stood out most for me. Um, there were students who, without generalizing all white students, who really, you know, I can't really relate to this discrimination thing. And I was most struck by this last comment, I am not my ancestors, right? And so um, that was, for me, it is something that reminds me what I have to get behind and in front of. I have to get in front of these kinds of comments so that I understand best how to uh, present this to my students. Um, so these are some of the comments, general comments from students and the, and the outlier was, you know, this is, this is the only assignment for something that I didn't appreciate. I didn't learn anything from it. And so that's really, really interesting, right? The students, it's a reminder to me how hard it is for all of us, regardless of age or position to really grapple with this topic. What have one, I done to share? Left. What have I done to share this? Well, I talk about it all the time at department meetings to include this morning. I'm going to do a professional development activity on the 18th of August for my colleagues. And my, less, my biggest lessons learned is that to move to anti-racism, I gotta move through racism and I have to take my students through that. And I need to racialize um, not only their mindset but the whole curriculum. And boy, do I need more time and effort and energy to do this thing. I was reminded of what I always believe about leadership and that is you can only lead other people where you're willing to go. So I'm, I'm reminded of the work that I have to do and I'm grateful for the opportunity in this program that allows me to do it. So that's it for me. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Deborah. That was really, 
inspirational. Um, Thank you. A lot of work to do. All right, wonderful. So I am going to uh, switch to our, our last speaker. Uh, last but not least, um, Monica Gal Galvin from Hartnell Community College. She uh, is a uh, psychology and also teaches college success there. And Monica, I think you go by Delia, do you? And it's the opposite. Oh, okay. <laughs> I go by Monica, my name is Delia. Okay. And All right. Thank you for having me here. And I am from the beautiful Salinas and um, representing Hartnell College. And I do teach psychology, intro to psychology and, uh, and college success seminar. Uh, Hartnell College has a population that is largely um, underrepresented in the, in the education system. Over 70% are Latinx students. And this is an amazing opportunity for me to share everything that I'm doing. So I'm very grateful to be part of this cohort. Um, the first thing I did when um, I, I started this project was to, uh, to change the book, the textbook that we were using. And um, because of the cost of the books, but I didn't know much about the OER and, uh, and I was expecting you know, uh, a book that wasn't that great. And to my surprise, I am super, super impressed by the textbook and the, the way it is organized, the way it's so easy to upload that to the Canvas shells. And the fact that I was able to modify some, some links that was amazing. That was an amazing opportunity. And this is what I'm sharing with all my colleagues. I think we should all be using these textbooks. I'm super happy with that. So that's that's one thing that it's the plus, right? Um, the knowledge that I acquired to, um, to use these things. Using that book, I, um, I decided to add in the Intro to Psychology, I decided to add a module that it's called the diversity issues in psychology or the lack of diversity in the field of psychology. And we started by learning about, you know, experiments and uh, microaggressions and stereotypes. And the, the open uh, question for the assignment was, why is it that diversity is important in psychology, right? And at the beginning, it was like, well, I don't know. Um, but then we started talking about how to implement this idea of diversity when we do experiments and what happened with the experiments that are uh, so unique that are already there and we don't have a representation of people of color. So it was, it was super interesting. The students really liked this uh, module and, um, and we learned to talk about stereotypes and uh, the lack of representation in the textbooks. And we talked about our own experience as people of color when, when we look the, at the books and um, my own experience, um, I shared with the students, you know, being an immigrant, uh, English language learner. And, and it was a very nice um, way of opening to students who, you know, many of them may have abuelita or parents who are just like me, immigrants too. So this was an important thing to talk. And we shared um, ideas after we learned about the ASH experiment and conformity and, you know, brainstorming about how are we going to do when we are in a large group and people talk about things that um, are not um, okay with us, you know, how do we stand up to microaggressions? And um, I, had, I had an amazing experience with this module. And honestly, the fact that I can change and put pictures, um, add videos, um, you know, and, and promote this idea of being part of this area as a diverse society, that's, that's very great. Um, and then um, I talked also about um, my project, my project with the Google site that I started creating. And unfortunately, because of this 
particular situation that we are living through um, and uh, the pandemic. I haven't been able to complete this, but this is a Google site that I created to use with the um, Intro to College Success, where I'm going to, um, I have different areas that I like to address. And um, from having the students sharing testimonials about instances where they felt um, aggressions or microaggressions. Um, and then, you know, they will have mini videos um, talking about how they felt. We have an area where I'm going to start putting um, things that are in, uh, in the field of psychology and any other area about, um, you know, racist attitudes in, in school. Um, we talk about equity. What does it mean to give everyone the same? Is that fair? Or we give people what they need so we can level the field, right? And then uh, I was um, able to attend several uh, webinars through OFAR that opened my mind because it was so amazing to finally be able to understand in one concept things that I have been feeling uh, myself when it comes to, um, you know, racist attitudes or, or how to fix things. So this- oh, one, one minute left. This is a work in progress. I haven't had the time to do this, but basically it's because of the pandemic situation, right? So I'm going to continue working on this. And um, so I lost my things here. So basically what um, is next for me is to, once I have the, um, the Google site developed, I will um, find uh, opportunities to share this with my colleagues as a professional development. I will continue to promote the OER textbooks because I think that's the best part. And once the face-to-face -face start um, again, the classes start again, we are going to be able to do more testimonials and be able to, to talk more about the things that are important and continue with this goal from OFAR. I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to do this and this is just the beginning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. This is, yeah, that, that uh, Google site looks amazing and um, the work you've been doing with your students. So. Um, Boy, uh, this has just uh, been an amazing hour that we've spent uh, hearing about all this work. And I really, uh, those of us in the leadership wanna say thank you so much and just a huge uh, congratulations on the amazing work you've done this semester in a very tight time period and um, online because of the uh, pandemic. So just amazing the progress. Um, and uh, I want to open this up to questions. And uh, James, I don't know if you want to jump in with uh, any thoughts. Um, well, thank you. And I'm just sitting here thinking, my God, I love my job. <laughs> this is just so fantastic to be here with all of you. Um, I, I think in, in a practical sense, I'll, I'll note that we certainly have, have, have uh, processed your feedback on the time frame and on, on better structuring some of the activities. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated in the interviews and the surveys. Uh, we've received really, really, really helpful feedback from our colleagues at the RP group so that uh, uh, if we are fortunate enough to continue this work in the coming year, uh, it will be even better. Thanks to all of you. Yeah, definitely. And, and we look forward to um, you staying connected with the project. Um, uh, we're hoping that some of you might like to be mentors for next year for those who might come on board um, to start that same journey that you did. Yeah, and, and I see Mar Marvin asked in the chat just about future possibilities. So quick word. So so we, we, we were extremely blessed to receive funding from the Hewlett Foundation to support this work uh, this year. Uh, we are viewing this as a pilot. Uh, the, the very positive feedback through uh, through uh, from you through the RP group uh, makes us feel uh, confident in approaching funders 
for to, to make make us able to continue this next year and to expand it. Uh, we're certainly proposing to expand it so that we're we're not just working with 17 individuals. As lovely as this is, uh, we would love to expand this work. So really, Marvin and, and others, just stay tuned. We we will know when we know, and believe me, we will we will share widely. Uh, and ask you all to help us share widely what possibilities uh, come, come, come to us and, and, and what possibilities are for next year. Thanks for the comment, Marvin. <laughs> Black guy who teaches child development, love it. All right. Well, I, I want to open this up so that um, you can ask each other some questions. Um, and I know that there's eight people, uh, eight of our wonderful participants who will present next month at our final webinar on, I think it's June 18th. It's the third Friday of June. And um, so please, um, there were some great comments in here, but I'd love to hear. Um, so please uh, unmute yourself and speak. I had a question. Go ahead. Robert. My question was actually for Nakia and the podcast that she created with the English class. Um, how did you actually create the podcast when you had people in different places? Did you record through Zoom and then turn that Zoom recording into the podcast itself? Or if you're shaking your head, yes, <laughs> or you're nodding, yes. Yeah, um, we won a grant um, at the very end of last year to do a podcast series. And I talked with uh, Raina Shalise, the, the other uh, faculty member about anti-racism um, and about the things that we learned. And she said, well, let's do that with our podcast. Let's make it into that. Let's make it for that. Um, and that's exactly what we did. Um, with the grant funds, we did get funds for microphones and funds for um, headsets that we, because we envisioned giving the students something having them recording on their own and coming back. But that didn't work because of the pandemic. It didn't work because of logistics. So what we ended up doing is we just set up meetings and then we recorded the Zoom meetings and then we pulled the audio off of those and we processed the audio into, into those podcasts. And um, it's really interesting because the students were very nervous coming in. Like, I don't know if I want to do this, but once they heard themselves and they saw it up there, it was like a bunch of students started to saying, oh, can I do a podcast? Can I do a podcast? And then when I said, you can do a podcast in lieu of an assignment, in lieu of the essay, it was like, okay, wait, wait we've got to go back to the drawing board and, and make this a part of the class permanently in fall. It got really popular. So, you know, our, you know, it's, it's our, the hardest thing is the processing it. Um, we do have a student assistant who helps us do that. Uh, you have to, it takes time to do it. Um, but again, we're looking at doing some really fun stuff for the That's fall. Cool idea. Thank, Thank you. you. That's great to hear you were able to use Zoom to record it. Um, and then I assume there was some editing uh, software on the back end for the processing. Yeah, very, very cool. Love it. I had a question for Oliver though. Um, so Oliver, you talk about expanding your project so that it's inclusive of, of um, community colleges or all community colleges. Can you talk a little bit more about like what you envision with that? I'd love if my students can participate. Yeah, thanks for that question. So the Dolores Huerta Smithsonian exhibit is really the vehicle I think to drive attention to the work that I'm trying to do. Um, we've had folks, we actually have analytics on the, the website and you know, people all over the country are using it. It's been flagged by the Smithsonian as a, as a model, model visual art or tour. Um, so I'm very pleased with that. And so what I want to do is try to get teachers who are, who are using that in their classroom in some capacity to also think about doing a survey one, two, three. Like another idea is like, um, you know, Dolores Huerta travels all over the country and all over the world. So like, you know, your, your, your Dolores story, like you know, people are doing these, these GIS surveys, that'd be kind of cool to show the, the breadth of her work. But I, I have a selfish interest really to focus on like rural communities, um, you know, the San Joaquin Valley, um, I, I meant what I said when I talked about like, th there's no archives regionally within the, the area that I teach. And so the student stories become the archive and ArcGIS and Survey123 become the vehicle to curate that information. Um, I, I didn't mention that I'm also doing this other 
project like on redlining and like uh you know school inequality using ArcGIS and survey one two three and so the whole idea is basically like getting students to engage their families right uh so it's a it's a powerful tool i hope that more institutions will subscribe to to esri which is the the, the company that does ArcGIS story mapping and and whatnot so uh that's my hope is to kind of package that into the the commons and so you know i'll be able to showcase the work i do create a survey one two three uh and then get people and kids and teachers to look at the Smithsonian exhibit. Thank you for that question. <clears throat> yeah, I was thinking, listening to Oliver, um, it, it occurred to me that, oh, wow, I'm, I'm missing an opportunity to tap students into what's out there publicly. So like the National Museum of African American History and Culture, I'm going to start now to look at that and see how I can tie students in uh, to that so that we can, and that's maybe the link to not only uh, business, but to their history. So thank you for that, for sparking that. And I want to say thanks to Alyssa Cooper. She uh, mentioned another tool for um, having students record podcasts, um, soundtrap.com. And Alyssa, have you used that before? Did you want to share a little bit about that? Um. Yeah, we, we create a podcast in my journalism class. And one of the, the issues that we had was the question that was asked, you know, how do you do that when, when your students are in different locations? And this tool, for the most part, it's free. They do have paid, it's a premium, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, where you, if you upgrade for different things, you can get, you pay for it. But the basics are free and students, it'll allow you when you log in, it'll say, uh, do you want to record a, a audio with uh, an inter interview and you send the link to that person and when they click on the link you can then start recording and then it's just this whole online editing I can go in and I'm, I can be editing and you're in there as well we can chat with each other as we're editing and share it's pretty cool great nice thank you Sharon it looked like you wanted to say something Thank you. It was just so inspiring to listen to my colleagues who I've never met just virtually. So very amazing. And I just wanted to propose, um, this is not um, feedback on your presentation. I thought it was awesome. Just a proposal that perhaps we can all collaborate one day um, collectively as a team to do an ASCCC um, presentation or at the OER OTC um, future conferences. Um, if we can definitely spread the word um, and expand on the knowledge that was gleaned from this um, particular opportunity. So just putting it out there, I, I've done um, an OER blueprint with Dave Dillon. Um, and I tried to reach out to a few who had the time. And I know if you were all busy, but I really would like to ask for us to be able to consider how we can collectively move forward and not end when our project is done. So that's just wanted to you guys are all amazing. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sharon. And, and maybe maybe you were not here toward, at the very beginning. We mentioned there is a, a California-specific OER conference this summer, Cal OER. Uh, I'll put I'll put the uh, link in the chat one more time. It's www.caloer.org, uh, and that is uh, focusing on OER in all three systems of higher education in California. Uh, it's being organized uh, by all all the systems, so uh, that would be a really great spot to uh, to share out on this. And I'll put the, drop the link uh, in the chat again. Yeah, thank you, Sharon and James. And the call for proposal is is open for another two weeks. I I think it's June fourth is yes uh, deadline for the proposal. Um, and I believe we were going to do kind of an overview uh, proposal um, at, around just talking about the program itself. Um, it would be wonderful to have some faculty presentations to go along with that. So really exciting. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and if you have any questions about the conference, just pop me an email. I, I'm, I'm happy to respond. Yes. James and his college are a co-sponsor, I believe. Yeah, together with ASCCC, uh, Cal State Chancellor's Office, uh, and Libre Texts, we're all working on it together. Oh, Cindy, go ahead. Thanks. Um, 
So great idea, Sharon. And I'm wondering if there's a way that we, those of us that are interested in doing that, if we could collaborate and do a joint submission, because um, I've been doing some of this work. I've done some presentations. I know you have for ASCCC and, so, um, and I think it'd be really a great forum. So I'm in. And if anyone else wants to join us, maybe we could meet and come up with a, a joint submission. Absolutely. That's my recommendation. We can hold each other's hand and go for it. Love it, Cindy. Yes. And you're the one I reached out to. Sorry. <laughs> so thank you. We're looking forward to the collaboration. Terrific. That's wonderful. I know it's getting late on a Friday afternoon, but um, we're, we're still here. If you uh, want to make any comments, um, ask questions, um, and while we're waiting for just a few last things, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen just um, so you can see we do have, a, oops, go into presentation mode here. Um, so we do have our final webinar um, in June, June 18th. And we're excited to hear from uh, the rest of our OFAR participants who I know will have, you know, wonderful uh, things to share with us as well. And uh, I think you've seen this slide a few times, so we won't, we won't <laughs> belabor that one, but some great resources there. And I think we've gone through questions. And so um, we want to thank you. Um, and we're still here for a few more minutes. Um, if you have any other comments, questions that you'd like to make, I think I would say our final um, comment is that um, there will be a final reflection um, form that we will ask you to fill out. And I think that will be available. Um, uh, James, and you can help me with this. I think that will be available the very early part of that first week of June, that week of June 1st. Um, we're just yes. kind of finalizing a couple of things. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Um, I hope you don't mind. I just want to ask a quick question. Um, is it possible to do another seminar like this and then have breakout rooms or have it, you do the seminar, you have the presentations, and then like maybe a week later, you have a follow-up one where we can break out because I I learned so much today and I feel like I want to now put it into action. So if there was a second one where we could then meet with the presenters and choose like which one like really um, affected us or we can relate or want to do something similar, I think that that would be really beneficial. And then my second thing was um, I. I think across the state, there was a ton of instructors that are doing what you guys are doing. Maybe not a ton, but there are a lot. And I think it would be really great to share that with the students that we do care as community college faculty, that we do care about our students, that we are, um, that we want to do better. We want our world to be better. And so if there was some type of marketing that could be done to share with the students that we do care, because I'd hate for them to think that we're I would like them to know all the great work that you guys are doing and we all are doing. That's really, really insightful, Molly. Thank you. That's, yeah, I, 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 yeah, both of those are really, really thought, thought provoking uh, suggestions. We will have to have to figure that out, figure out both of those. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really great suggestions. I, I would love for, um, some of you, I think, to share at some of the student conferences that are coming up, so we could look into that and and um, and see what the what the timeframes are on that. And love the idea, Molly. That might be something we could organize in the future. Is that 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 um, that kind of participation where you could go into a breakout room uh, with someone who's done this work and really dig in. So love that. Maybe the conference. <laughs> Might be an opportunity at the conference on on a, obviously not for every course, but yeah. Wow, what a what a what a way to end the week! Thank thank you everyone for your incredible gift, gifts of your energy and inspiration. It's just really, just uh, yeah, an amazing amazing gift that you're sharing with us. <laughs>